Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello everybody, Bob Lusk, must be 6.30 on a Wednesday, going live, hanging out with you guys, and uh, see if we can't cover a few topics tonight, see what's going to happen. It's, uh, I was thinking about talking about, you know, it's kind of an echo in here, so we'll just have to deal with that. I'm back home at LL, comma, three, Lusk Landing, comma, three. Hello, John Funk, good to see you, buddy. Looks like Nick's there, Mark Overby. Let's see who else we got. There's James Allen checking in. Hello, James. Good to see you, fellers. Um, I kind of been thinking about the topic for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> and I think I'm going to talk about, I was telling the girls earlier today, because they always try to write some kind of a cute little intro for me. And uh, they did that again. Um, I think I'm going to talk about the relationships between fish. I mean, sitting up there. Hello, Fred. Good to see you, buddy. Dustin Crawley, good to see him. Drew Bachman. Oh, you guys, that's good. You guys know the drill. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Click like or the little heart thing down there on the button, wherever it is. Share this to your timeline, and you are eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat and a Palm Boss t-shirt. We have those the drawings about once a month, if, if I remember. Um, Brother Thompson, big storm, so the night off. Hey, thanks for the happy birthday. I had my birthday was Monday, and it, I don't usually make a big deal out of birthdays unless they have a zero on the end of them. And then sometimes we still don't. But I got up about 4:45 and left about 5:15. Drove two and a half hours over to a lake to meet American Sport Fish Hatchery guys. They were going to electrofish two lakes that have a pretty big meaning to me because I helped design both of them, and got to see some really, really, really nice fish. And so. I spent my morning hanging out with those guys, looking at some giant fish. As a matter of fact, if you'll look below this post after the show, you can see some pictures of the fish uh, that we put up. And I put those up, I mean, just a few hours after we took those photographs. Those, those are feed train fish in the first pictures. I haven't put up the second set of pictures. So we'll see. Um, let me see here. Holy cow, we got all those folks checking in. We got 35, 36. I am going to talk about the relationships among fish. And part of the reason I'm going to do that is because right over there is the Brazos River. Now, I wanted to broadcast from our, our we have a screened in porch where you can see the river behind us. But right there, we've got this big hole in the ground that someday will be a swimming pool and there's no leaves on the trees. So I rethought it, came back into this, this little, um, where it's going to be my office that we haven't decorated yet. So we'll get to that before long. And, uh, but as I thought about it, I thought, you know, today I was thinking about from that river back in, in 19, starting in 1969, August of 1969, I was 14 years old. Um, one of my siblings got in trouble since this is kind of a public show. I'm not going to talk much about that, but, but that sibling got busted shoplifting at a very young age. <laughs> so my parents came to the conclusion they needed to get us out of the city. We grew up in, in the suburb of Fort Worth, North Richland Hills. And so they bought a place about five miles as the crow flies from here on Mitchell Bend on the Brazos River. We spent pretty much every weekend there. And at 14, 15 years old, you can imagine, I mean, we would get there on a Friday afternoon just before dark. Mom demanded that we unload the groceries and upper put them up, which we were good with that. And then I'd go get in the river. And most of the time it was maybe knee deep up to chest deep in the deepest places back then. And I learned every every sandbar, every gravel bar, every boulder, rock, snag. There was a tree that was that was there coming up from the river bottom, and and I would tie my trot line onto that tree and catch catfish. But after a, you know just a couple of years of doing that, I made up my mind way back then that I was going to make a living messing with fish. And fast forward from 1969 to now, that's what I've done. It's really it's really fun and. When people ask me how I'm doing, my response is I still lead a pretty cool life, and I do. And some of the things I learned from the river, I was, I was able to, to convert some of that instinctive knowledge, just some of that experiences that I got as a teenager. And then when I went to Texas A&M University and studied about fisheries management, and then hung a shingle out and went in and started doing it, 
I started seeing how valuable over a long period of time, how valuable the relationships are between all the different species of fish. So I want to talk about that a little bit tonight and just kind of share some of those things and provoke some, some thoughts for you guys. And I know there's a storm blowing through Mississippi and it's headed right toward Birmingham, Alabama. Hello, Mark Dyer, Michael Eric, Leah Groon. Good to see Leah from up around Beggs, Oklahoma. Wyatt checking in from Denver. Matt Marsden, Tennessee. Billy Miller, Flash Flooding, St. Louis. Yeah, man, I haven't seen Billy in a long time. Justin Ludwig. Linda John Madsen in Illinois. Ice out. That's great. Got to talk to Lathram earlier today. He sent me some pretty cool pictures. Hey, Jacob West gets to watch us live tonight. That's so cool. Dustin Crawley, Gary Elburn, John Funk. You mean like how a channel catfish loves bluegill as much, if not more? Yeah, that's one of the things. Absolutely. Hey, Vito. Good to see Vito. Thanks for the birthday wishes. So my birthday, I spent the morning, you know, working on lakes, looking at some huge fish that I've helped play a, a little bit of a role in. And uh, we shocked up. I say we, they did. I, I stood on the sidelines and watched and then took pictures when they got back with the fish. But they shocked up probably 60, 60 bass in a three-acre feed-trained pond they call fishbowl over there. And uh, my nose is itching. And so uh, uh, when they brought them in, the relative weights were all 120 to 160. The biggest bass was just an ounce or two shy of eight pounds, which those are northern strain bass. So an eight pound northern strain bass is a hero. But the majority of them were three to six pounds with a couple of really, really big ones. And I mean, they look like just footballs, just, just, just look huge. And you can see some pictures, a handful of pictures. Let's see here, Doug Cusick, Danny Mack. Hey, Danny, good to see you, man. Ben Kusterin, man, I, I know I'm not saying your name right. My apologies. Mike McPherson, Michael Gray from Nashville, Tennessee area. Billy Miller's spillway is raging, and his Texas Hunter has at least a foot of water up both sides of it. Um, how's the motor do with getting, you know what? I have seen motors survive that kind of a dilemma, and I've seen them not. But I know this, Texas Hunter customer service will survive, survive that dilemma and what I'm going to tell you is as soon as you can safely get out there, raise the lid on that feeder and take all the feed out. Because uh, some of that feed's likely wet. And it's going to clot or clog and make just big chunks. So take the feed out, put it in a trash bag or something. And if there's any mold on it, don't use it. If there's clumps in it, get the clumps out. And then take it back up after it dries up and make sure that feed's dry. And then clean the feeder out because if there's any moisture in that feed, it's going to mess you up. And then after it, after it dries up just a little bit, then see if your feeder works. But don't turn it on. Matter of fact, if you can get to it, I'd probably go down and unhook the battery on it right now so the motor doesn't try to kick in. Billy Miller says that. All right, so now um, and, and some of those motors, I've seen them get wet, dry out, and work just fine. I've seen them get wet and not. So it just depends on the circumstances. Hey, Josiah, thanks for the kind words. Travis checking in. Hey, David Schneiderman. David's one of our sponsors, Easy Docks of Texas. Let's see here. Frank James. Yep, Danny Mac. Is love still better than like for your growing influencer status? You know, I don't know that. Somebody said it is, so I don't know that. And I, heck, I don't know. All I know is that Facebook doesn't let you build an audience unless you boost your post. You know, so if we, if we can gain an advantage and get, you know, all I care about is getting the word out there. If we can get the word out there and it helps you guys and it helps us, that's great. But I think my, part of my calling is to do things like this, to get, get the word out. Uh, Dave Weber enjoyed this, the little video snippet earlier this week. Received my March, April magazine in the mail today. Very anxious to dive into the Habitat articles. There's some good stuff. So I did, I did do a little uh, live video that's below the photographs of that exercise on my birthday over there at Bradley Oaks Ranch. So you can see that on the, on this Facebook page after the show. After the show. Josie! Holy cow, I see Josie. We need to catch up with you guys soon. We almost got this home ready where we can have company. Debbie's still about that far away. We got another painter coming tomorrow. I'm hoping he gets that, gets that knocked out. Hello, Kim Moore. 
Uh, Frank James is interested in the interaction between hybrid stroppers and largemouth bass. Do large hybrid stroppers help keep down the largemouth bass numbers at all? Do they compete? You know what? I will get into that. Now, the way I'm going to do this, after I greet everybody, I'm going to greet as many as I can, then we're going to get into the topic. Uh, look at there. Holy cow. Um, I missed something here. Owen Nelson from Nebraska. Good to see him. Todd Austin, you guys know the deal. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like or click heart. Share to your timeline. You're eligible for drawing for a Pond Boss hat and a t-shirt. Drew Hay, got an early night. Good deal. Good to see you, Drew. Pond Builder from Pennsylvania. Dion Myers did it right. Mark Dyer, Texas Hunter, is going to have their new artificial habitat available directly to consumers online, but only through pond managers like yourself. Oh. Uh, any possibility you can show us a brochure or what their new habitat products look like? Yeah, I can do that. I sure can. They sent me some. I don't have them with me here. They're at my office, but I can do that. All right, let's start talking about fish because here we are 10 minutes in and I hadn't hit the topic yet. Uh, Crown Royal Neat, maybe. So what I was going to tell you is spending time in the river I got to see the fish actually migrated. I got to see, like, for example, my brother and I, my, our, our daddy bought us a little 10-foot John boat, and there was a bait store in Benbrook, Texas, on Highway 377, and we'd stop there some Friday afternoons and just buy stuff. One of the products they had were they had these big um, cane poles that were probably an inch in diameter, maybe a little bit bigger, seven feet long with a four or five prong gig on the end of it. So my dad bought some of those gigs and then we had probably four or five, we accumulated four or five Coleman lanterns back then. You put the fuel in them, then they had mantles, you'd burn the mantle and it would be like ash. And then, you know, the globe around it and the handle on it, green, dark, kind of a dark green, those lanterns. And when the light started to fade, you'd, you'd unscrew a little handle, put your finger over the hole and you'd pump it up and it would pressurize the fuel cylinder in we're inside the you know the bottom part of the lantern so we take a coleman lantern and usually my little brother would get on his knees at, on, in the bow of the boat and withhold that lantern over the front edge of the boat and then i'd pull this up and down the river and the current was always pretty mild if it was too strong we wouldn't go but but we'd go up, go out there at night. We might go out there from dark until midnight or one sometimes. Now, stomach brought us home when we were hungry. But if we weren't hungry, then we were going to gonna hang out in the river. Well, as time went on, I started seeing some really cool things. During a full moon, like channel catfish, for example, they would be up underneath rocks and in crevices. And they wouldn't be moving. I could actually step out of the boat and water knee deep or maybe mid thigh deep, get down on my knees and reach under a rock and, and touch that catfish. And then it would bolt and run off. Now, I don't like admitting this because I'm being recorded, but we would gig some of those catfish and we'd always take them home and eat them. But the primary fish we gigged were carp and gar and on occasion a buffalo and a couple of times pretty big yellow cats. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know. I didn't know it was... Uh, illegal back then and nobody told me but who cares we did it anyway um travis i wasn't going to drink but since you are i might have a swig <laughs> yeah okay just then mr thompson forgive me the lord has blessed me and but not with this so i'm just gonna sip on it maybe we'll see what happens i don't know dave septon is about to drown over there in illinois with the rain that front came through here last night it hit about 1.30 in the morning here, and just it wasn't bad, but, you know, as it goes east and it's that hot air, it's going to build up and go. Um, so, the things I was learning in the river that were pretty fascinating is, is fish behavior varied from night to night based on what conclusions I came to were the phases of the moon. At the dark of the moon, you could get in that river and fish would be flying by you everywhere. And I don't care what species it was. There weren't very many largemouth bass in the river back then. I, I, I bet you the whole time I spent in that river, I probably didn't see 20 largemouth bass. Um, but there were quite a few channel catfish, lots of carp, lots of gar, shad coming up through there. Um, on occasion, there'd be some drum, and there'd be uh, an, a rare occasion we'd see some buffalo come by. 
Now that was before they put hybrid or strappers and hybrid strappers in Lake Whitney downstream. So now I'm sure it's, it's different. But the point is I started seeing how these fish behave differently. And it made me start thinking about it. Then when I went to school and started learning how to learn, that's basically what I got. Um, oh, Fred, you know what? I don't know what Crown Royal is, but that's what I had, and it ain't that good. <laughs> it probably needs Coke in it. So Crown and Coke, which is one of the things Bruce likes. And uh, I, I need to learn more about it. Okay. Oh, thanks, Mr. Thompson. You just I'm not going to get drunk on this. I guess this isn't wine, but I like wine. So, thanks for that tidbit, Fred, and thanks for the confidence. Richard Williams, vodka and lemon juice and water for me. You know what? I like that. Debbie likes that. Oh, once or twice a week, maybe. Um, so, now, after I got out of college, now, you got to understand, this is before Al Gore invented the internet. You know, there were no mobile phones. Nobody had a computer. If you made a phone call, and Fred Bingaman will back me up. Fred Bingaman invented Southwestern Bell. I'm confident of it. I think he invented the phone. Fred's like 122 now. And so uh, if you were going to make a call to get information, uh, you know, I mean, when I say information, there were some fish farmers that I, I was getting to know back then. Bus Hartley rings bell up in Kingman, Kansas. I would call Bus, and when he would talk to me, I would talk to him. And then I'd get a bell, a, a bill from Ma Bell for 25 cents a minute. That's what it cost to talk on the phone. So the information you could get back in 1980, 81, 82, you either got it from a book in the library or somebody that's been there that did that, or you just it just hits you right in the back pocket and you learn by what you what mistakes you made. So 1980 was the year the state of Texas stopped giving away free fish to stock ponds and lakes. So that's when I started seeing there was going to be a niche and there, there was going to be a void and, and people were draining ponds or rotating, rotating ponds or building new ponds. Most of them were stock ponds for livestock where a rancher would call and say, hey, I can't get any free fish anymore. I'm going to have to buy them. You know, and at that point, they were spending anywhere from 200 to $400 an acre to stock a pond. Well, you could buy land in West Texas for $300 an acre back then. So when they were spending that much money on stock and fish, they wanted to do something to take care of them. So the pond management industry began to develop back in the mid-1980s. But as I was going down the highway, I rode a lot of miles, delivering fish, stocking ponds, killing moss, uh, electrofishing lakes and things in those early 80s years, trying to figure out where I might fit. Uh, and so I started thinking about all these fish. So... So we, we could stock channel catfish, fat ed minnows, bluegill, and largemouth bass. And that was it. So I started learning as much as I could. There was a book called The Third Report to the Fish Farmers that came from the Extension Service at Stuttgart, Arkansas, from the Southern Regional Aquaculture Center. And I got my hands on a copy of that book. And basically, it was The Third Report to the Fish Farmers gave the lifestyles and the life stories of, of the different kinds of fish that were cultivated on fish farms. That included fathead minnows, golden shiners, uh, channel catfish, and to a lesser extent, bluegills. And uh, they didn't talk much about largemouth bass because those weren't really a thing on fish farms back then. But they did highlight, you know, some of those other fish that I considered lesser fish. So I began to learn that channel catfish were cavity spawners, for example. You know, people think that channel catfish are, 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 are scavengers. They are not. They're, they're predators. You know, a, a two and a half pound channel catfish is going to compete with a one pound bass for food. Now, one of the things I began to learn is where the fish's mouth was placed influenced its behavior. If it had a mouth pointing up, it's a filter feeder. If it had a mouth pointing down, it's a scavenger. If it has a mouth on the end of its face, it's neither one of those. Like a grass carp eats grass. It's a grazer. You know, carp are bottom feeders. They feed in the muck. Gizzard shad feed in the muck. Channel catfish are predators. And the, I think the best term, the scientific term, is opportunistic omnivores. So what that means is they're like teenage boys. When they get hungry, they're going to the refrigerator. If they can eat meat, they're going to eat the meat. But if they don't have any meat, 
Man, they'll eat vegetables. That's what channel catfish do. Now, I have caught channel catfish with everything from frogs in their bellies to, to small bass in their bellies. You know, when I'm electrofishing and, and, and looking at stomach contents. So what I started trying to figure out was how do fatheads live? What do they do? What's their role? How do they play? So fathead minnows, I learned, stick their eggs on the underneath sides of firm objects. So if a pond doesn't have a place for fathead minnows to spawn, they're not going to do it. You know, they don't like sticking their eggs on the side of a dock piling. They'll try to do that if they can. But if there's a board attached to that dock piling that's under the water, they'll stick their eggs on that. They'll stick their eggs on rocks. They'll stick it on pallets. I started using wooden pallets and, and four inch PVC pipe bundled in, in uh, 18 inch sections and made like a pyramid and it would be like a fathead minnow hotel. You know, now fathead minnows, they only live 18 months. So that means they reproduce a lot. And the babies start having babies after about nine months. But the problem with fathead minnows is they get to be about that long and they're slow. So when you're that long and slow and you live in the littoral zone where all the predator fish live, they don't last very long in a, in a, in a pond with any predator fish. So fathead minnows' number one role is to jumpstart a lake to give it the, the forage fish before you put predators in. And then like in a bass lake, their role is to feed baby bass, newly stocked bass, fairling bass, for up to 18 months to give them the jumpstart as the bluegills are establishing, reproducing, and providing the backbone of the food chain for a pond. So fathead minnows, they'll actually eat fish food. You can, if you've got a pond with only fathead minnows in it, when the feeder goes off, it looks like rain on top of the water. Now, they have a little bitty mouth, so they prefer a little bitty food, but what I've watched them do is, is using Aquamax fish foods, they'll come up and peck on it, and as it gets wet and soft, you know, then they're gonna consume it. So that's fathead minnows. Then you take bluegill, for example, they're colony spawners. They like to spawn in gravel or sand in shallow water, 18 inches deep, you know, and they'll go build what looks like little cattle hoof prints and they reproduce. They're predator fish as well. So they're carnivores, limited by their mouth size. You know, a full grown bluegill, when I say full grown, six, eight, nine inches long, which is about as big as they get in most ponds, unless you're feeding a, a, a good high quality feed like Aquamax pond fish food, you know, the, the sport fish brands, and, and those different that line up if you're feeding that then your bluegill will get bigger but you take a six or eight inch bluegill open its mouth and a, and a number two pencil barely fits in the fish's mouth so that fish makes a living on eating tiny little bitty fish and insects and they they'll now they'll they'll go pluck some of their food off of periphyton so rocks and habitat is great because bluegill can eat the insects that are feeding on periphyton you know, and then bluegill, they like to spawn based on the temperature. So we're, like where I live here, it is, it is, I expect bluegill to spawn four times a year. Now you go over to Brownstown, Illinois, where Dave Sefton and Fred Bingaman live. If the fish are really healthy, they're going to spawn three times a year. Most likely two if, if you're not feeding and, and getting their, you know, their body condition up. You get up into northern Iowa, up near where Michael Eric lives in central Iowa, one time, maybe twice a year. So your management strategy is going to be different. Okay, bluegill, they might get to be a pound, pound and a quarter in most lakes. That's a huge one. Uh, we shocked up some on my birthday that were a pound and three quarters and some that were a pound and a half. You can see Sean uh, McNulty holding up a pound and three quarter bluegill in the, in some of those pictures. So, uh, uh, there you go. There's fathead minnows and there's bluegills. Let's see here. Billy Hartley stocked my pond west of Kingman. Doug said, I love those guys. I remember Billy when he had dark hair, dude. And he probably remembers me when I did. All right. Steve Thorburn finally made a live pond boss. Kind of on time. Great. Kansas. Good to see you, buddy. Um, let's see. Ian, feeding bass with a big Aquamax food. Got any tips on how to keep how to get more keen on eating it. Yeah, let me tell you this. If you're feeding big Aquamax fish food, the, the whole secret to feeding fish is consistency. Same place, same time every day. And if you're feeding the Aquamax largemouth, you've got to have feed trained largemouth bass for them to eat it. 
I'm, 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 I wrote an article mostly today. I'm not finished with it. It's going to be in the May June issue of Pond Boss that talks about whether or not you should use feed trained bass and then some of the myths and misconceptions about feed trained fish. Like I, I'm, I'm going to stay on topic, but I'm going to run off on a little tangent here. Um, when you're when you if you're presenting fish food to your pond and fish are not eating it, it's probably because those fish don't eat fish food. So minnows will eat, fathead minnows will eat it, golden shiners will eat it, bluegill will eat it, channel catfish will eat it, tilapia will eat fish food, hybrid stripers will because they were raised on it and you're not going to buy any hybrid stripers unless they were raised on it. But your largemouth bass, crappie, smallmouth bass, red ear, uh, to a lesser extent yellow perch, yellow perch will condition to it, just takes them a long time. Those, those fish, if you're trying to get largemouth bass to come to eat fish food in, in your, your fishery, they're probably not going to do it. You might get two or three out of a thousand that will come, and that's a good thing. But feeding those fish consistency, the temperature, the temperature's got to be above 55 degrees, and the higher it climbs, the, the best window to be feeding fish is from about 60 to 84 or 85. Now, they'll eat when it's warmer, but they're sluggish. Just same place, same time every day. Jeez, I don't know why that happened. Uh, you got to be consistent. And if you're consistent, the fish that eat fish food, they'll be consistent. Um, let's see here. Kevin's resubscribed for two more years. Thanks for doing that. I appreciate it. And if you guys haven't subscribed to Palm Boss Magazine, look here. Here it is. Here it is. This is the March, April issue. It's in mailboxes now. Um, 64 pages of... Pure gold, I'm telling you, even though I write most of it. <laughs> a great article in here about evaluating wildlife with drones. This issue, creating diverse habitats with from um, Mark Cornwell. Otto, don't forget the little things. Finish Strong, he talks about how to wrap up a when you're building a lake. Michael Gray, who's on the show tonight, he's got a story about a Tennessee sinkholes. You know, so <laughs> he's got some experience with that. And one of my favorite columns is not about fish. It's, it's Backyard Nature Notes by Birdman Mel. Birdman Mel is a, a pretty well-known guy in the, in the bird business, birding business. And he always has an article in here about how to, uh, how to attract fish. Got the fifth installment on Building Lake Deanna from outside of Kansas City. Planning for infrastructure. If you're getting ready to build something on your property, that's a good one. And here's a spring calendar. That's a real good one. Talks about when to stock, you know, the different things you need to be doing. We also have our resource guide out. The resource guide is this. You can also get this online at pondboss.com. We vet our advertisers. You know, it, it, I like, at least I have a conversation or Leanne has a conversation. Then we discuss what these companies do. And I've turned people down because it's important to me. I don't ever want to get that call that a vendor that's in this Pond Boss resource guide didn't do what they said they were going to do or did something that some customer didn't like. You know, on occasion, somebody doesn't like something, but it's not because somebody's dishonest or not trying their best. That's that's part of the deal. So we've got everything from aeration systems to feeders to all stuff about ponds, pond management right there. And you can get that at pondboss.com or just call the office and Leanne will send you one in the mail, especially if you're a subscriber. If you're a subscriber, you got one with the March, April issue. Um, since it's almost seven, I, that's when I like to pause and thank the folks that sponsor us. I've already said thanks to David Schneiderman, Easy Docs of Texas. He's a longtime sponsor, advertiser with Pond Boss. Uh, if you're looking to, 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 to get a, a doc, give him a shout. And you know what? I'll tell you one of my favorite things about David. And this is the, this is the truth. And he'll be the first one to tell you. He's going to ask you some questions about your pond and what kind of dock you want. And then he's going to tell you if his products are suited to what your goals are and how your pond is. And if it's not, he'll be straight up. He'll tell you, you know, our products are great. It's not a fit for you, you know? And, and that's one of my, that's one of the things I cherish about David is he's straight up about stuff like that. It's just because he's got a warehouse full or he's got somebody else with a warehouse and he needs to sell their products, he's not going to shove it down your throat and say, this is what you got to have. You know? But what he can do is, is, is he's got all these different cool pieces. 
If you got jet skis, he can accommodate it. If you want to rail around it, he can accommodate it. You can make it any shape or form you want. They're floating docks. You know, they're modular floating docks. They're pretty darn cool. Uh, Purina Mills. Every show I talk about Purina Mills. Started working with those guys in 1995. And I love working with Purina Mills. I'm loyal to them, but I'm also expecting results. There's been a couple of times when I got a little frustrated with them because because sometimes the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing, but that had nothing to do with the products. It had everything to do with distribution or, or folks not being able to, to get the product they needed. You know, and so their products are, are outstanding. I've grown some three pound plus bluegills on Aquamax products. The feed train bats. When you, when you look at those pictures down the line on the Palm Boss Facebook page, at that live video that we did on Monday and the pictures on top of that, those fish have eaten Purina Aquamax products their whole lives. And they've made a living on that. Texas Hunter Feeders, love Texas Hunter Feeders. The products are outstanding. The customer service is outstanding. I can't say enough good things about them. I've worked with those guys for a long, long, long time. Let's see here. I'm gonna back up here and see what I'm missing. Oh, there's Chris Blood. Good to see Chris. Holy cow, I'm getting behind y'all. Thanks for staying with me here. Okay, um, Jeff Wallen, what temp should I turn on my aeration system in central Illinois? 55 degrees. If you turn it on at 55 degrees, just for insurance, I'm gonna tell everybody, check the temperature of your pond top to bottom if you can. You know, get out off the dock, check it in one foot intervals to see the temperature. As long as it's the same temperature top to bottom, which right now it should be, nobody should be having stratified ponds unless you're in Southern Florida, maybe South Texas, you know, or, or Southern part of California, maybe. You know, we got some Southern California viewers. So check your temperature. As long as it's pretty much the same at the top as it is the bottom, just turn your system on at 55 and let it run. Now, if you're, if you're stratified, if your temperature at the top is 10 or 15 degrees warmer than it is at the bottom, go through the startup phase. And if anybody needs to know about that, we'll do that topic another time. I'm going to try to stay on topic here. Uh, Richard Williams, I have a new pond. So are you saying I should stock with minnows before I add bass and brim? Absolutely is. So going back to that relationship, it takes, when you start looking at trophic levels of the food chain, every level has a tenfold energy change. So let's say you start off, we're gonna start off at the base. We got, we got the food dissolved into the water column, then you get a plankton bloom. It takes 10 pounds of plankton to grow one pound of insects. It takes 10 pounds of insects to grow one pound of bigger insects and baby fish. It takes 10 pounds of insects and baby fish to grow one pound of small to medium-sized fingerling fish. It takes 10 pounds of those small bait fish to grow a pound of intermediate size bait, uh, bait fish in bass. It takes 10 pounds of those bait fish to grow a pound of bass. So when you start looking at it like that, you gotta build your food chain up. And that's why it's important to know the roles of all these different species and their lifestyles and how they interrelate. So fathead minnows, they're gonna get eaten fast. They can't, they can't stand the pressure. So their sole job in a brand new pond is to create enough bait fish exponentially, because they will, to provide the first year to 18 months growth of newly stocked fingerling largemouth bass. While the bluegill are growing up and they're beginning to reproduce to create the backbone of the food chain for the longevity of the food chain for your bass. You know, now, when you look at bluegills, some people say, well, bluegills aren't that big a deal. Well, yeah, they are. They are, because they, they are gonna be the basis of the food chain in successful bass fishing lakes. Now, what about red ear sunfish? You look at a red ear, it looks like a bluegill. Well, it doesn't really, but if you look at them side by side, you can see there's a big difference. Red ear sunfish are also called shell crackers in the South. That's because they eat snails. They have these two little one, oh, oh, in the back. <laughs> they have these two little bony pads in the back of their mouths. And so they can suck in a snail off of a plant and push it to the back of their throat and those bony pads compress and they crush it. And that way they can digest it. So they can digest the goody out of that snail. They even digest part of the shell of the snail. You know, so it has a different food habit than bluegills do. Red ear sunfish typically spawn once a year. 
So they're an added insurance policy in yours and my ponds because they fill a gap. Let's say, for example, like right now, if your bluegill just spawned and we were talking about a feeder being a foot underwater and your bluegill spawned last week, guess what? Your baby bluegill, a significant number of those are probably going to go over that raging spillway. Well, they're going to, right behind them are going to be the red ear sunfish and they're going to be spawning when the water goes back down. And then after that, the bluegill are going to spawn again so they can keep that food chain moving on. You know, and then you start looking at fish like hybrid bluegill. Well, a hybrid bluegill is a cross between a green sunfish and a bluegill. Typically, a female green sunfish bred with a male bluegill. And the reason those were grown was to minimize reproduction, although heavy on the word minimize, they still reproduce. However, 95% of those are males and the females can't reproduce with those males. So it's got to be like a male bluegill that can reproduce with them. And so you're going to start getting back crosses. But the primary purpose for a hybrid sunfish is not for forage fish. It's because they can grow fast. They have a bigger mouth and they're easier to catch and they're real aggressive and kids love them. So if you have a pond, say with catfish only, hybrid sunfish are a pretty good choice if you want to have a second fish. Now you got to be ready because they're going to wart you to death when you're trying to catch your catfish. The bluegill are going to come steal your bait. So it's because their behavior is, is, is active, aggressive. Channel cat behavior, even though they're predators, channel cat fish are more nocturnal. They like night. They like dark. The reason they stay close to the bottom is to avoid sunlight. Remember I told you I the channel cat fish had their noses under the rocks during the nighttime when the moon was full? They did, but during dark of the moon, man, they're, they're out rolling. They're out moving, feeding, active. You know, like they're going to eat when they're hungry and they're going to be predators. But also, when you throw a bait out to catch a channel catfish and that bait hits the water, it runs away from it. Where a bass and a bluegill or a sunfish is going to run toward it. You know, so what the, What you do, and I remember an old, 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 uh, when, uh, when we were driving around in the basin of what's now Lake Granbury, right up the road here, back in 1969, I've told this story on the show before, but we came across this old man Anybody over 30 back then to me was old. This, this guy had bib overalls and a khaki shirt, and he was mad. I remember he was mad. And he was dragging a John boat across a sandbar. Well, my dad told my brother and I to go get that boat, hauled it across, loaded it in his pickup, and he was talking to my dad, and he was mad at the government because they were flooding his river, and he'd been fishing that river his entire life. And he said, son, I'm going to tell you something. 90% of the fish live in 10% of this river. He stuck his finger in my face and told me this. And you, if you can find where they live, you don't have to be a good fisherman. You're going to catch fish. Well, he's right. You know, the, the, the other part of that equation is that, he told me, is that when you're fishing for catfish, throw the bait out there, leave it out there, and then a catfish is going to come bump it. And if you look at a catfish, you got whiskers on the side and whiskers down here. Well, these little whiskers, all of them are covered in taste buds. So a channel catfish is going to run away from the food and then come back to it. Now, this is most of the time. If a catfish is hungry, it'll hit a crankbait. Some of you guys are out there saying, wait, wait, he ain't right. Well, I'm going I'm to qualify this a little bit. Every good bass angler has caught a channel catfish on a crankbait. And that's because they're in that active hunting, go eat mode. And that's what they're doing. Whereas and normally, if you're fishing with like a piece of a gizzard shad or or dough bait, or whatever your favorite, you know, shrimp, or whatever, liver, whatever your catfish bait is, they'll come up and they'll bump it, and they'll taste it. So this old, old catfish fisherman said, don't set the hook. When you feel something bumping that bait, leave it alone. Because when that catfish tastes it, if he likes it, then he's going to eat it. Then he'll suck it in his mouth, and then he runs with it. That's when you set the hook. So catfish behavior is, is nocturnal. Uh, how do they interrelate with bass? They compete with bass. That question was asked earlier. I'm going to get to that now. Channel of catfish compete with bass. So when somebody tells me or asks me a question, should I have catfish in my bass pond? Well, I'm going to tell you what I know about catfish, and I'm going to tell you what I know about bass, and you choose. Now, by the time a channel of catfish hits two and a half pounds, it's going to compete with a one-pound bass. By the time a channel of catfish hits 12 or 13 pounds, it's competing with a five-pound bass and lead a one-pound bass. You know, so you need to know that. And you need to know that behavior and those interrelationships. So a, a channel catfish absolutely will compete with a largemouth bass and outgrow them. They can get to be, I've seen channel catfish 18 or 19 pounds 
in private lakes. Now those are usually, you know, 100 acre lakes or 125 acre lakes, but I have shocked up catfish that knocking on the door 20 pounds. And that can eat, they can eat a three pound bass and they will if they can, you know? And so then I, I keep, this, I'm gonna stay on track with these different fish. So there's, now we know fat ed minnows, bluegill, red ear sunfish, channel catfish. Largemouth bass, depends on how big it is. You know, little bitty largemouth bass newly hatched. Once they start to come off the bed, you know, okay, so, so, so the male builds the nest then he goes and chases down a ripe female, nudges her, bumps her to come to that nest then she'll lay as many eggs as she wants to. Then she vacates. And then he gets those eggs and bundles them up into a little pile. And if another female is within range, he'll go get her and she'll lay some eggs. He'll reproduce, uh, fertilize those eggs. While the first female goes to another nest and lays more eggs. So that's how the genetic integrity stays intact. You know, because all these are kind of promiscuous. A little bit in, the, in a natural sense, in an acceptable sense. Um, hey, there's Denton Leisner, Cannon Feeder. Good to see you, buddy. I'm going to back up and see what I'm missing here. I'm going to come back to it. Jeff Wallen got that. Richard Williams, yep, yep. Uh, yes, you need to stock minnows and bluegill before you add the bass. So I would stock the bluegill fathead minnows, let them get established, give them some time to, re to grow up, reproduce, then stock the bass so they don't overeat the food chain. That's why I went through that trophic level, the 10-time conversion all the way to the top. So you can do the math on that. It might take 10,000 pounds of plankton over a span of time to grow 10 pounds of bass. You know, and so as long as you understand that and you can provide at those different levels, like one way to bypass fertilization is through feeding. And the feeds are so good now that their conversion rates are so high <coughs> that I have less reservations about fertilizing ponds. Now in the South, you know, we were raised fertilizing ponds. I'm starting to kind of get away from that, but it's also because we have better fish foods now. You know, so that's that's a pretty good answer for that question, I think. Um, Jeff Thompson, raising F1s in the hatchery pond on feed, how long can you leave them in the hatchery pond before they do not transition well to a larger body of water? That's good. There's Big Daddy Boudin Man, Christopher Aguilar, checking in. Um, all right, so let me, I'm going to talk to to that subject, Jeff. Um now, F F ones. What he's talking about there are F one. And, and American Sport Fish has a trademark on tiger bass, where they uh, cross some outstanding Florida bass with outstanding northern strain bass. They get an F one. Now, it's actually it's not a not a hybrid. It's an intergrade cross between two of the same species, just different strains of that species. So the babies can reproduce, and they will. You know, and so uh uh. When you raise them in a hatchery pond on feed, if you can leave them in the hatchery pond till they get to be eight to 10 inches long, and then, now let me tell you how you need to transition them. You need to, before you move them into a larger body of water, I would buy 40 or 50 pounds of fathead minnows and let them learn if they're only being fed fish food, that even though it's instinctive to be a predator, they need to be conditioned to that, you know, at eight to 10 inches long. You know, now, there's a whole nother hour I could talk about conditioning fish into a new lake. For example, it's common to take, if you're going to stock 20 or 30 of these bass per acre in a 30 acre lake, odds of them finding the fish feeder is not nearly as good as you think it is because that's not stocking them at a density enough that they're, that, that they're going to be competitive enough with each other to go find the feeders. So there's that that's a whole nother show we could talk about. So I'm gonna stay on topic. Um S Steve Thorburn, stocking men with minnows, both fatheads and goldens, and maybe gambusia, let them go a half a year to a year before stocking. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's kind of depending on where you are. If you're in the South, I wouldn't wait a year. But if you're in Iowa, Illinois, you know, the Midwest, I I would. I would wait up to a year. Now the problem with waiting a year in southern ponds is if you don't, if you're not proactively stocking and managing a pond, nature's going to do it for you, especially if you're in a watershed that's got other species of fish. You're going to wind up with some of those. Uh, Drew Bachman, I have every issue ever made of Palm Moss Magazine. Really? Wow, I didn't know that. I've known you, but I've known you for a while, and I didn't know you had all of them. Graham Stone's about to start feeding in an established four-acre pond with at least bass and bluegill. Any tips other than water temperature and consistency just mentioned? 
Um, yeah, just to be, I would feed Aquamax MVP. That's the feed I would feed. Same place, same time. Don't expect your bass to eat it, but expect your bluegill to eat it. Feed them in water four or five feet deep if you can. If you're feeding them over deep water, the bass are going to figure it out and come eat the bluegill while they're eating the fish food, which it's okay with me. If it's okay with you, Mike Fornash, good to see you. Jeremy Duckworth, howdy. Drew Schmidt, what's the maximum time you would transport fish in a bag with oxygen? Ask the hatchery because if you put five pounds of fathead minnows in a bag with oxygen, they're going to make it about 45 minutes, then they're going to die. If you put three pounds, you got an hour, 15, hour, 20 minutes. If you put one pound, you got four hours. So the volume that's put into that bag and the size of the bag influences how long they're going to live. So go fast. No tickets. Just go fast. Uh, Kevin, I tried to get some Aquamax MVP from Tractor Supply in Michigan. It cost 85 bucks. Yeah, that's um, every single Purina dealer, not Tractor Supply, every Purina dealer can get that fish food on their regular deliveries. And the way it typically works is they place their orders on a Tuesday. They get their feed deliveries on Wednesday. If the warehouse doesn't have MVP, then they got to order it next week, which means you got to call them again before the next Tuesday to order it because they don't carry over orders. And I, it took me a long time to learn that. I didn't know that. you know. So work with your Purina dealer because it should be around $45 to $50 for a bag of that stuff. Okay. Yep. Drew Schmidt's got it. Frank James. Yep. There you go. That's it. Oh my gosh. You guys are jumping on that. All right. All right. All right. Uh, these floating dock manufacturers need to have the ability. Talk to, talk to, uh, Schneider, Schneiderman about that. Hello, Chuck Brinkman. Where's the girls? My control's late, but picking up a deer, pickling a deer, pickling a deer hide. Oh my gosh. There you go. You're tanning your own hides. Uh, Kevin's caught a channel catfish. Travis fishing with a guy on Lake Fork. Crankbait hooked, caught a 10 pound cat daddy. <coughs> um, Billy Miller's out hunting muskrats. Do I think they came in just now with a flash flood? Um, wouldn't surprise me because if where they're living is flooding and the water's rolling, they got to get out of that and go somewhere else and might as well go to your house. You got good, you got good bourbon, not, not like what mine is. I don't even know what it is. I got to call Bruce and ask him. I'm not a bourbon fanatic or a whiskey fanatic. I like it. And I know that the good ones are smooth. <laughs> That's about all I know about that. Danny Max catfish is 20 pounds, 32 inches. And that fish, I know that fish has been caught four times because I've seen the pictures of it. Mark Dyer, on my lake, we catch more catfish with crankbaits and chatterbaits than bass. We have too many. There you go. And the bass numbers suffer. There you go. There's an example of understanding how all these fish behave. With the topic of talking about relationships, the more you understand about these different species of fish, <coughs> then you can begin to understand the interrelationship. So after I learned about the four basic fish, then I thought, you know, I've learned about those, but I, I'm starting to see carp and gar and stuff like that. What about those? So I started learning the, the behavioral habits of carp and gar and buffalo, <coughs> crappie, hybrid strappers, green sunfish, warmouth. So the more you can learn about these different fish and how they behave, how they eat, like warmouth, for example, if we shock one up in a private lake, the client usually says, let's throw that thing out. We well, used to, I'd say, yeah, let's throw it out. Yes, it, it doesn't belong here. But they reproduce better in moving water. They're more uh, suited to creeks and, and, and channels and rivers, you know, and they don't overwhelm a pond. And when you catch one, and look, you're going to think it might be a crappie if you've never seen one because their mouth is so big. That's another thing about the relationships with fishes that you need to know. The size of the mouth and the placement of the mouth is going to tell you where that thing fits in the food chain. <clears throat> I'm talking so much, my throat's starting to argue with me. That seems to help. Oh, <laughs> that made you laugh. Um, James Allen, 52 pound channel cat caught in K Kentucky Lake yesterday, in your Kentucky Lake yesterday. That's pretty amazing. So, which that's a huge catfish. That's going to be a 52 pound. Nah, it's not a channel cat. That'd have to be a blue cat. I don't like calling people out publicly, but uh, I think the a world record channel cat is like 24, 25 pounds or something. I may be wrong on that, but 
But a 52 pound catfish is probably a blue cat. Might be a hybrid blue cat, channel cat. Like, for example, learn about blue cats. Blue catfish are gray poupon fish compared to channel catfish. They, they only are predators. They're, they don't go to the refrigerator and they open the door. If there's no meat in it, they slam it shut and they're mad. So they're going to go out. And I shocked up a 52 pound blue cat one time in a fishing lake south of Houston. Had a three pound bass in its belly. It was supposed to be a bass fishing lake. So you need if 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 you study these fish and you like if I know that a catfish is going to weigh forty pounds, absolutely yes, it's going to impact the other fish because it's got big feeding habits and it's going to rule the roost. I I saw went to this, the the bait shop I was telling you about earlier where we got our gigs. I think my nose is itching. That means somebody's coming to see us. Uh, they had a, a big stock tank there and. They had, somebody had put a really big flathead catfish in there. And being a teenager, I was gawking. Whoa, that's amazing, you know, looking at it. And the uh, bait, st bait store owner went over and he dipped into a vat of bait fish and he picked up a, a goldfish about this big. He said, watch this, this is pretty cool. He poured, he threw about two of those, get, uh, those goldfish down in that, in that tub with that, that sole fish, that, that uh, flathead catfish. And it laid there. And those goldfish were swimming around, you know, trying to mind their own business. And he turned real slow, eased over, sucked one into his mouth, killed it, spit it out. And I thought, that doesn't make any sense. So I, the, then the, the bait store owner says, he does that almost every time because these guys are territorial. And if something comes in and they don't really want to eat it, they're going to kill it. He said, that catfish there will kill a three or four pound carp and might not eat it. So I, I didn't believe that. I thought, why, why would he suck a perfectly good goldfish into his gullet and then spit it out, you know? Well, it's their territory. That's what they do. They, they guard that territory. Now, all fish, to some extent, especially when they're reproducing, they're going to guard the nest. They're going to guard their habitat. When you get a reaction strike from a largemouth bass, you're making it mad because you're invading its personal space. It needs its personal space. If you invade that space, it's going to attack. You know, so those are behavioral things. So, you know, if you've got a bunch of bluegill tormenting a bass on a nest, that bass is going to defend that nest. And it's going to do everything it can to run them off or kill them or whatever it can do so it can protect those eggs. So the different behaviors, and you start looking at fish as a community, then you can start to see how those, those different uh, species and the sizes of those species influence the behavior of the entire fishery. Uh, there's a, a, one of my favorite stories is over near Lone Oak, Arkansas, is Button Willow Club. And I, I talked to those guys the other day and just had a pretty cool conversation. But I think it was back about 19, probably 90... 495, 96 through there somewhere. I can't believe that's almost 30 years ago. They had this 100-acre shallow lake, and they couldn't grow any fish in it. They could hunt ducks over it, but they also had another 40 or 50-acre lake that was a lot of flooded timber, green tree flooded timber, that they could flood it and then pull the water off and let the forest grow, where they could hunt ducks. And it was a hunting and fishing club. They loved to hunt ducks. But they, want, they, they called me and said, what can we do with this big shallow lake and not, you know, here's a, here's our budget, whatever it was back then, 50,000 bucks or something. So what we talked about, what they did was it was a levied lake that they could pump full, but even full, it was shallow, had a lot of one to two foot water in it. So I said, let's take the deepest corner and let's go back, you know, a couple hundred yards, and let's build a levee and just make a big, let's just cut off a corner of it which ended up being about 20 plus acres, and let's turn it into a great bass fishing lake. So we did, we did that. And then they created some cool habitat. Uh, and I can't remember the circumstance, but six or seven years later, they had a fish kill. So they called me and said, can you come see what's going on? Did all the fish die? We need to see what's going on. So I drug the shocker boat over there. We launched it and got out in there. And there were areas in that lake where we were shocked. We didn't shock up a single bass, but we shocked bluegill up everywhere. And there's no reason ever 
that you should see a bluegill out in the middle of a lake in open water where the water is 10 or 12 feet deep. You should never see that. Well, that was a, a lesson to me that the bluegill were not threatened so they didn't seek cover. There was no tornado coming. They were going to be safe. You know, but once the bass were stocked back in that lake, those bluegill headed for the hills and they went to places where they weren't going to get eaten. And that's behavioral. So if you can understand that with those relationships, then you can manage your fishery a whole lot better. Crappie, people ask me about crappie all the time. And when somebody said, calls and says, hey, palm balls, I want to stock some crappie in my pond, what they're telling me is, they're not saying, I want a fish that's going to make my rod bend and make my heart beat. What they're saying is, I'm going to, you know, not going to make my heart race. I want some meat to eat. That's what I want. That's what they're telling me. I like that sweet, succulent, thick, you know, fillet off the two sides of that fish. That's what I want. So then when I start explaining to them that these are top-end predators limited by the size of their mouth, and they're going to feed lower on the food chain than a bass will, and that when you've got it, you're going to really have to have them in there with largemouth bass to keep them from overpopulating so much. If it works and they're so unpredictable as spawners, you know, because they're spawning first, but they're going to spawn within a certain temperature window as the temperature's going up and down. So they're not consistent spawners. They spawn first in warm water ponds. You know, they're limited by mouse size and they're going to move around in schools. And they come shallow for two or three weeks a year, then go out and hover around cover in deep water or spread out and compete with all the other game fish. And then the end gain is you're going to end up growing 20 to 25 pounds of crappie per acre per year, of which you can harvest maybe half of that. So if you've got a three acre pond, you're going to be able to harvest about 20 crappie a year and get eight or nine pounds of fillets. That's okay with you. That's okay with me. That's behavioral, okay? Because they're going to have to compete with other fish for space and for food. And those other fish are going to have to compete with crappie for food and for space in that order. So that's the way that stuff works. It is 727 and I have not gotten to your questions. I'm going to pause there. It's real important to understand the relationships of those fish. The way I figured it out was looking at them for years and years and years studying it for years and years and years, but basically taking each species and learning as much about that species as I can and then come to the conclusions based on the results I see, how they're living together underwater. David Schneiderman, I got about 30 cormorants taking up residence on my new pond. Is the fine per bird or one fine for all? Oh, you know what? I've never been fined. I don't know that, but I think the more egregious it is, um, I know the, uh, let's see, district judge in that county now, he's building a lake, <laughs> which I don't know if he has anything to do with that. It, uh, yeah, let me stay on the topic. Um, 30 cormorants on, on your new lake is way too many. And if you need to buy like a, a carbon dioxide cannon or, you know, not carbon dioxide, what the heck is it? Um, it's a cannon that builds up gas and then pops. If you can get rid of them that way, do that. i tell you something that I saw work one time. Uh, these guys over at Ville Big Lake in Irving, Texas, got a John boat, and they put a mannequin in it. And in the mannequin's hands, now, I'm not telling you go get a John boat and get mannequins. I'm telling you what they did that worked. And they put a fishing pole in each mannequin's hand, in the hand of each, each both hands. And at the end of the fishing pole, they tied pie pans, those aluminum pie pans, and let them bang and clang and, and switch, and, and that ran the cormorants off the lake. They also had two or three other cane poles with short pieces of monofilament with, with those pie pans on it. I don't know how that worked, but it worked. So there's a little tip. Maybe that would work. Let me see. I'm going to scroll down here. I'm not going to quit till I get these questions. Uh, Billy Bates, how about red or bluegill? Will they ever crossbreed in a natural session? Uh, natural setting. Yes, they will. Now, it's temperature related and it's really rare because typically red ears spawn in between bluegill spawns. However, it's not unusual for a male bluegill toward the end of their spawn, I mean a male red ear toward the end of their spawn when the bluegills are coming back onto the same beds that a red ear will cross with a bluegill. It's, it's not unusual, not rare. It's, it's not common, but it, that happens. It's not unusual that we will see during certain weather conditions 
Three years later, from those weather conditions, we'll see crosses that have to be a cross between red and bluegill. Um, Kirk Swallow, how many times should I feed my fish per day and how many seconds per day? And you're in South Louisiana, as I recall. I'm going to tell you to start off right now, feed twice a day for about three or four seconds, and then watch the fish. As long as they're consuming all that feed within about 30 seconds to a minute, that's about right. If they're eating it all within five seconds, you need to feed more. Now, if they're really, really, if you bump it up to six or seven seconds and they're still eating it so much, add another feeding and spread those out from three to four, uh, three to four hours apart. Fish food converted to fish poop as fertilizer. Yes, it does. Sure does. And that, and that can be an issue, if, especially in small, um, small ponds. Uh, on the Mississippi, on Shad, they bumped the bait further. Okay, talking about Chatch and Channel Catfish. Yep, there you go. How will Gizzard Shad neg negatively affect bluegill? Well, here's how Gizzard Shad can affect bluegills negatively is because they like to uh, root around in the mud. They have a gizzard. That's why they call them gizzard shad. So gizzard shad are, are digging around in the mud in shallow water, and that's where they're feeding. And if the bluegill are in, in shallow water with a little bit of mud trying to spawn, shad can disrupt their spawns. Now, where gizzard shad can really impact a bluegill spawn, the population, it's not because they're competing with them, but once the gizzard shad get to a certain density, they give off a pheromone that inhibits, inhibits reproduction. And not only does it inhibit their reproduction, it inhibits bluegill reproduction as well. Okay, Frank James, how do hybrid stripers and largemouth bass interact? Well, when the, when the hybrid stripers are fed well enough, they, they'd rather stay out in open water and not come in to the shoreline where largemouth bass are. However, if they're not fed well enough, they will condition to come up and chase bluegill. So I like to have shad in a hybrid striper pond to minimize the hybrid striper's risk of coming toward the shore. Now, they're still going to do that. So they're going to interact, but they're going to interact as competitors. So it'd be like putting a basketball player into a football game or a football player into a baseball game. You know, so even though they're playing two different games, there's crossover. You know, they're going to meet each other at, at Luby's. <laughs> And just wipe them out, you know. So that's that's how they interact. They interact as they compete for food. That's their biggest interaction. Ari Thompson. So I had fat ends and bluegill, and wait, how long before eating bass? Well, you're in Mississippi, so if you had fat ends and bluegills right now into a brand new pond and you stock the right numbers, I'm comfortable stocking bass fingerlings by about the first of June, middle of June, first of July. If you don't stock a good number and let them establish, I'd rather see you wait till the fall or even a year later. Travis, mine orders on Monday, get it Friday. So there you go. So Travis is Purina dealer orders on Monday, get it on Friday. Troy Todd, good to see you. Frank James, uh, yep, talking about those birds. Danny Mac, okay. David, got you. Okay, y'all are talking. I love this. That's great. You guys, I love it. Uh, Kentucky Channel Cat Record. Is I understand, man, check that. I'm going to look that up. I don't like being wrong, and I don't like calling people out. But I bet you that's a blue cat. However, you know what? I'm going to leave that right there, but I'm going to look it up, and if I'm wrong, I'm going to tell you I'm wrong. Uh, Frank James, how to get rid of a large group of cormorants. The best way to get rid of a large group of cormorants is to get rid of the scout bird before the group shows up. Oh, what? That's what Frank said. There you go. Okay, oh, there's James Allen. It was a blue cat. Okay, there we go. Would blue cats be able to help control gizzard shad? Will they also eat channel cats? Um, you know what? A blue cat is kind of finicky. Yes, they can help control gizzard shad. They'll eat a channel cat if it's small. Uh, is it a mistake to stock them in ponds under 50 acres? I would stock blue cats if I wanted gigantic catfish. That's it. That's why I would stock blue cats. If I want blue cat, if I want to grow some big fish that will break a rod, I would be looking at blue cats. Now, in smaller waters, you know, like a one or two acre pond, you can put blue cats in there with channel cats, for example. And the channel catfish are going to outgrow the blue cats for the first two to three years. By about that third or fourth year, the blue cat catch them, and then after that, they pass them up. 
You know, so if you want a good firm flesh to eat in small waters, I'm not opposed to blue cats. But here's another thing about fish behavior is <clears throat> you might put 200 channel catfish in a one acre pond, for example. You're going to lose a few to attrition. Most of them will come to feed, although they won't all come to feed at the same time. But you will never catch all those catfish. There's some of them that are permanently hook shy. They're just not going to bite a hook. It's not going to do it. I've seen that happen over and over and over. About 30 to 40% of them you can catch fairly easily. Another 10 to 20% you can catch with patience. The rest of them are going to be hook shy. You're just not going to catch them. So that's why I learned when I put catfish in a pond, I want to be able to drain that pond every period of time or whatever and get them out and start over. Okay, let's see here. We got uh, Billy Miller talking about that. Okay, just shot a beaver. <laughs> Watching this show, hunting. I love it. <coughs> Michael Eric talk hybrid stripers. Hybrid stripers are feed trained. So hybrid stripers can't reproduce. They're a true hybrid. They can't breed. So what you stock is what you get. And their behavior is their tendencies are to their predator fish because they're a cross between a, a white bass and a striped bass. You know, so their instinct is to go eat fish. That's what they like to do. But hybrid stripers are actually conditioned to fish food. So when you buy them, every single, and I stand to be corrected, but I'm 99% sure I'm right. Every little bitty hybrid striper comes from Keogh Fish Farms in Keogh, Arkansas. Mike Freeze and, and his partner Martha over there. <clears throat> She's the landowner. He's the biologist. And those fish are conditioned to fish food on that fish farm. So they will come to fish food in your lake depending on the size and the quantity that you stock. If you stock a bunch of like this into an existing bass lake, they go from being a nice little hybrid strapper into a snack. They're going to be gone. you know. But if you stock them at this size and you stock 50 to 100 per acre, odds go up that they're going to come to that fish feeder and they're going to eat. All right, let's see here. Uh, channel catfish, 32 pounds. I, I, I believe that. Okay, Blue Ribbon Discussion, says Frank. Thank you. All right, I have canes over all the time. Okay, propane. Yeah, propane, that's a good one. CO2, there you go, carbon dioxide, that's it, CO2. Propane cannon, there you go. Good gosh, you guys are great. <laughs> Look at all these guys chiming in, I love it. <coughs> Brent Kearns, yeah, Brent Kearns, I kind of forgot about him. He's, he's over in southwestern Oklahoma, and he buys the small fingerlings from Keo and feeds them up. So he, that guy, that guy knows his stuff. He's, he really does. Brent is uh, north of Wichita Falls. Okay, let's see here. Make sure I got all this. You gotta love these. I love these conversations between you guys. Okay, well, I'm gonna start wrapping it up. I think I covered some pretty good ground tonight. This ought to be a good one to hang on to, to talk about this, but... Here's your take home points. If you can learn as much as you can about the different species of fish that you want and learn how they eat, how they reproduce, what are their growth rates, how big will they get, how often do they spawn, how do they spawn, where do they put their eggs, threadfin shad lay their eggs on grass at daylight within, they can start spawning at, dawn, at, 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 at just right before dawn and they're done by 45 minutes after the sun comes up. You know, gizzard shad, they're gonna lay a quarter of a million eggs and get, wish them luck. Golden shiners are going to stick their eggs on grass. You know, uh, channel catfish are cavity spawners. If they don't have a place to spawn, they go in and hide and protect the eggs. They're not going to do it. You know, so the more you can learn about these individual fish, the better decisions you can make on how you're going to manage your fishery. So that's the way we're going to wrap it up. Hey, I always appreciate you guys watching the show and the input. I love the conversations going on back and forth. I love that because if you're sharing your experiences, with folks and what's worked for you and what hasn't. That's part of the exchange and part of the intrigue of this whole deal. So uh, I'm not sure where I'll be next Wednesday, but I know I'll be hanging out with you guys. So until then, adios from Lusk Landing, comma three. Bye.